At this point, we switch back to our vulnerable conditions analysis. Um, as a quick review, vulnerable conditions is an alternate analysis of vulnerability. Essentially, we're trying to identify the conditions associated with the vulnerability, and examples being drought magnitude, reservoir conditions, uh, demands, etc. Now, this is the same exact figure that we used earlier as an example for this type of analysis. It's the leaf area deficit vulnerable conditions scatter plot. And the top pane is the baseline results, which is what we saw earlier. You'll recall 11.2 million acre foot eight-year dry period mean and 38.2 million acre foot long-term average define that space. Now, as we introduce some portfolios, you'll see portfolio A and B there we've significantly reduced the number of uh, red marks on the figure, meaning we've reduced a high number of vulnerabilities, which would have been reflected in those bar charts we just looked at. Now, we can take this a step further and say we can redefine our conditions based on the new vulnerability scatter plot under the portfolios. Now, why is this important? Well, the key here is we can quantify what we've gained in terms of the portfolio's implementation. Uh, I would venture to say that you could easily shift that vertical line on the x-axis about a million acre feet to the left to redefine the vulnerable space for portfolio A, meaning you've gained a million acre feet per year resilience against that eight-year drought we've been talking about. Now that's important but it goes beyond because depending on how you've quantified your scenarios, if you've quantified too many, and I'll call them easy fixes, meaning they're sitting just in the vulnerable space, a small portfolio investment might actually bring a lot of those traces from the red to the gray or from vulnerable to unvulnerable. The problem there is that you may be overstating the effectiveness of that portfolio because you're simply counting the number of traces that moved from vulnerable to not vulnerable space. However, you may have only shifted that space by a small amount. Conversely, if you have a lot of what I'll call hard fixes, traces that are very vulnerable and hard to really move from the vulnerable space from the red to the gray, it's going to be very difficult, even with a large portfolio investment, to see a high number of traces shift. And so, you wouldn't be very happy if you'd invested a large portfolio but only saw a few traces come out of the vulnerable space into the non-vulnerable. However, if you knew that you'd actually added a million or two million acre feet of annual resiliency, that might make those results uh, seem different in that light. And so, in addition to offering this complementary information to simply counting the number of traces in and out of vulnerable conditions, we can actually start to think about are the traces I've quantified uh, missing some spaces in the distribution? Are there too many hard fixes? Are there too many easy fixes that are maybe skewing my results a little bit? So what we'd like to do here is go back to our uh, Tableau workbook and just look at a few results. So what we're looking at here is the same type of figure we just saw in PowerPoint, but now we're looking at the Lake Mead falling below 1,000 uh, water delivery indicator metric. And you can see we've got different definitions in terms of what is vulnerable in terms of that eight-year um, dry period and the long-term flow, but ultimately the concept is the same. And as we implement portfolios, we see fewer and fewer red marks, and we see more potential to shift the vertical and horizontal definitions of this yellow vulnerable space, both left and down. We can also introduce or filter using the Tableau workbooks so as to remove certain scenarios and see how the results change.
So if you're particularly interested in these results here, or perhaps some of these red circles that are uh, vulnerable but didn't fall within our vulnerable space, you can start to see what scenarios are they associated with, and just to see are your conditions more effective for certain supply-demand combinations and perhaps less effective for others. So last, we want to just talk a little bit about how is each portfolio accomplishing the results that we've just seen. Uh, what we're showing here is two different uh, vulnerabilities. The left column is that upper basin leaf area deficit indicator metric, and the right column is the lower basin uh, lake mead below 1,000 indicator metric and associated vulnerability. The rows across are different supply scenarios and the colors represent different portfolios. On the y-axis, you have percent of years vulnerable, and on the x-axis is total annual cost in 2060, and that's in billions of dollars. I'll just note that the costs are, in fact, in 2012 dollars, even though this is out in 2060, and obviously there's a number of assumptions going into these different uh, portfolio costs and option costing, and we're more interested in using it as a relative comparison as opposed to focusing on it as a pinpoint precision number. Uh, the kinds of things we're looking to explore in this analysis are how much are you reducing vulnerability relative to what we believe the cost might be, what type of options are you using to get there, and I'll just focus on this is not an approach to identify a best portfolio, but an exploration of the strategies and their associated trade-offs. To talk a little bit about this figure that we see here, um, baseline reliability is shown in the dotted line for each of the results, and under the first two observed resampled and paleo resampled supply scenarios, we see very low vulnerability in that the portfolios have almost no difference amongst them. This is generally perceived to be the fact that they're all pulling from a common set of, for lack of a better term, low-hanging fruit to achieve those same results in bringing the risk or the percent of years vulnerable down to effectively zero. Now, as we get to the paleo condition, we start to see that the baseline had more elevated levels of vulnerable years, and we start to see a little bit of separation from our portfolios. However, we're really not seeing a lot of difference. Finally, when we get to our GCM scenario, we start to see some differences amongst these portfolios. And what this means is that the low fruit is gone, and we're starting to see some differences amongst the strategies of how to meet our most challenging scenarios. And so we're going to use the Tableau workbooks again to explore a little bit more as to how these different portfolios are going about accomplishing that effectiveness. So what we have here is effectively the same exact figure. However, we've grouped our supply scenarios in a different manner. On the top row, we've got all water supply scenarios. And what we see is that because the baseline had 6 or 19 percent of traces vulnerable, uh, we're just not seeing a lot of separation amongst the portfolios when we're averaging results across all those different scenarios. However, as we move into the middle row, which is supply scenarios with low stream flow conditions, effectively below the 50th percentile, we do start to see some separation. And then when we get to the lowest stream flow conditions, meaning this bottom row, which I believe is about the 20th percentile and below in terms of their stream flow, we really start to see separation here. 
And so a few examples that we can look at are under the upper basin vulnerability, the leaf area deficit, we see that portfolio D has the lowest cost. However, it's only bringing vulnerability down from about 30% of years to maybe 15. Now the two portfolios that brought it the lowest were C and A. And A might be a little bit lower than C, but the cost is substantially different. And so this is something that we may want to explore some more and understand how come portfolio C is coming in at about $5 billion, whereas portfolio A is around 7 and they're achieving effectively the same uh, vulnerability reduction. Um, there's probably a trade-off there, but this is the type of um, first cut that allows us to identify things for future exploration. Similarly, if we look at the lower basin need below 1,000 vulnerability, we see that the baseline result was 71% of years vulnerable, and that we are able to actually bring that down to around 25% with portfolio D, which is again our portfolio with the fewest number of options. It's that common space in the Venn diagram. And probably what's happening here is it's just running out of options. And so it's somewhat capped at its cost because of the number of options and yield at hand. However, some of our other portfolios with more options and uh, related higher cost can bring that vulnerability down even further. And again, we see a similar sort of situation where portfolio B and portfolio A are effectively bringing our percent of years down to the same level, but at different costs. And this is, again, where we'd want to be able to explore and understand how are these two portfolios achieving that reduction and why is the cost different. This is a bit of a challenging diagram to look at, but it helps us to start to answer those questions of how are these portfolios going about achieving the reductions in risk that we're seeing. Uh, all the columns represent portfolios A through D, and on the y-axis you have a variety of options that we considered in our portfolios. The vertical black line you see in each individual uh, box or cell represents the earliest possible time that that option was available. And so if we scroll down here, you can see that there's a time axis on the bottom of each one of these columns. And that the color is indicative of how many traces or the percent of traces that have that option implemented through time. And so when you see red, and red uh, indicates 100% or close to all traces, you know that that's being used a lot. And when you see red right up against that vertical black line, like is the case here for this energy water use efficiency option, you know that under all the traces in portfolio A, we're really relying on that heavily and implementing that option as soon as it's available. While if we just move over here to portfolio B, we see that it's never being implemented as soon as it's available, and then only in low amounts as we move forward to even in 2060, it's a relatively low number of traces under portfolio B. About 18% of traces uh, are using this option. So this is where we can start to go into some more of the detail of how are these different portfolios going about achieving uh, the risk reductions that you see. And in some cases, you don't even see any color, meaning that that option was not part of a given portfolio. So Tamarisk watershed management apparently did not make the criteria for portfolio B and portfolio D for whatever reason, whatever those criteria that were established filtered it out, and so it's not being used at all. Whereas portfolio A and C by 2060 are actually seeing as high as maybe 70% of traces using it. And so that's again where you'd want to go back and explore and understand what are the trade-offs Maybe it's less reliable and that's why I didn't make it in, or maybe there's something else going on and really get a good feel for uh, why are these results showing the things that they are. Okay, um, so at this point we're going to go back to the PowerPoint. And Carly is going to take us through summary, study limitations, and next steps.
Great, Ken. Um, thank you. So I'm going to wrap up here with these three items over the next 10 minutes or so, and then we'll um, open it up to questions. So this is quite a difficult study to summarize in a few bullets or so, but um, these are really uh, broad kind of take-home messages to think about um, looking at all of the results of the study. So the first finding here is that uh, across the board, through all of this analysis and through all of the different resource metrics that we considered, um, we demonstrated that the system is vulnerable if we do nothing. So the results of that baseline analysis clearly show that there are some vulnerabilities across all of those resource metrics. However, with the implementation of the portfolios that we explored, we see that doing something will greatly reduce that vulnerability. And through the analysis of the vulnerable conditions that Ken described, we are able to make ourselves more resilient to those adverse conditions. So those, those lower long-term means and lower um, drought spells or more severe drought spells. We're able to weather those um, better. However, we're not eliminating vulnerability. So we're always left uh, with some level of vulnerability, even if we're implementing the portfolio that has the most options available um, and is very uh, inclusive in terms of the options that it will select. And um, this is really due to the fact that we're dealing um, with a system where our allocations and our use and demand exceed what the supply is that the system is bringing. And so we're always going to have some type of vulnerability uh, to weather and manage through. If we look at what all of the portfolios have in common, in the near term, the, what's being implemented throughout the portfolios are options such as municipal and um, agricultural conservation, a variety of water transfers from agricultural to municipal uses, and reuse. We're seeing these are cost-effective ways to reduce the vulnerability. However, as we look down the road in the longer term in that 2040 to 2060 period, we're really starting to see some more trade-offs emerge in terms of what an acceptable level of risk is that these options are able to mitigate against, that what is the expense of that mitigation, um, both uh, to the resources and other implications. As with all studies, uh, there are limitations associated with these studies. Um, just a couple that I want to mention here. Um, the detail and depth to which the analyses were performed was limited by the availability of the data, uh, the models, the methods, um, and the capability um, of the existing models uh, to um, be able to use that data and um, simulate future conditions. So some of the limitations that exist uh, from this fact are the ability to assess future impacts to the basin resources. Many of the resources um, to fully understand how they're performing require uh, analyses beyond um, the time step or the spatial detail that we were looking at, in addition to other factors beyond flow. And our um, methods were limited in the ability to do some of these analyses. Another limitation was with respect to the options characterization process. I mentioned earlier on um, that a team was put together to do this characterization. Uh, it was very much at an appraisal level at best. In some areas, it was less than that. In many cases, the team disagreed with respect to some of the characterization. Um, for example, thought the ratings for various uh, criteria should be higher or lower in certain cases. And I think that in the end, there was agreement reached that there needs to be um, additional analyses for many of these criteria to move forward and understand these options better. Um, another area that was limited was the consideration of options. Um, due to the time and resources available in the study, the quantitative analysis was really focused on um, a, a select set of options. And this by no means should be considered um, the full gamut of options that should be considered in moving forward 
to deal with some of the supply imbalances that are projected in this study. Another limitation is with respect to the geographic scope of the study, um, the lower basin tributaries, so namely the Virgin River, Bill Williams River, Little Colorado, and the Gila River um, were handled differently than the other tributaries in the upper basin. Um, these are not natural flows, these are gauged flows, and in the case of the Gila River, this is not included in the model that we use. And so this is an area that we're going to move forward in to better understand the use on these tributaries and in some cases develop natural flows um, and include those uh, into our model. So where do we go from here? Um, in the study report, so that 100-page document that summarizes all of those technical reports, uh, there's a section that describes next steps, or more specifically, the areas where next steps should be taken. <clears throat> Those 10 areas are listed here, and um, that section of the study report uh, discusses various methods and um, directions that we should move forward in for all of these areas. And it summarizes that direction by saying that we want to move forward in a collaborative approach, the same approach that was demonstrated um, throughout the study. And so we are gearing up to move forward in each one of these areas um, in uh, different ways. But before we do that, and really what uh, today, the purpose of today was, was we wanted to um, conduct a series of educational outreach sessions to help folks really better understand the type of information that's included in the study um, and what some of that information can be interpreted as. So we did two of these outreach sessions last week, face-to-face um, -face sessions, one in Salt Lake City and one in Phoenix, and today concludes these series of outreach sessions. Um, beyond that, we're going to reduce, work together to reduce uncertainties related to the areas that we found to be very promising and included in all of those portfolios in the near term, those things such as water conservation and reuse. And we're also going to work to further our understanding of water banking, um, augmentation type options, and weather modification concepts. We will also embark on a study of uh, tribal water issues to better understand these. This is an area that the study um, didn't go into much detail in, but working with the native tribes and communities throughout the river basin in the study, we understood was an area that um, they want to understand better the impacts of imbalances on tribal water issues. We will always continue to advance the science and modeling tools used in the study to be able to address some of those limitations that I just previously listed. And in moving forward in all of this and really speaking to the comprehensiveness and the broad resources that the study considered, we want to consider strategies that provide a wide range of benefits to all water users. And so with that, um, this concludes our presentation for the educational outreach session. I want to thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy to answer any questions.